Good afternoon, everybody. I must have an admission to make. Actually, when Tim wrote to me, I thought to myself that, what did I do? And But then when he asked for the abstract, then I thought, oh, he was serious. Till late yesterday, I still was thinking. And when we got around the table, I thought, oh my God, it was more serious. So the presentation that I had handed over to Kyle had to be changed at the last moment. Yeah, well, no, that's the way it is. I thank uh, JB for giving me an opportunity to speak to you. Uh, but 20 minutes for teachers is like clearing the throat. They need it that much. But let me also suggest that when uh, Tony spoke for about 45 minutes, I developed deep appreciation for my students who have to listen to me for about two hours. So uh, 20 minutes is a long time. Thank you. So let me, let me go to uh, my, what I have been doing, uh, you know, uh, about last 10, 15 years. Uh, the, this is the general outline that why databases and then I had a question for myself while I was an undergraduate student and I have carried that question that still uh, needs to be answered. And what were the earlier postulates and how I have in my small way contributed to change certain perspectives in ecology and how we can using these databases, how we can, uh, you know, almost transform a small microcosm into macrocosm or small microecological, you know, um, uh, ideas into macroecological ideas. So, and finally, as, uh, as Tony said, that, that what's the use if nobody uses it? So who will use all this uh, information that we're creating? So, well, uh, I, uh, there was nothing actually when I started, when I started writing the abstract, I had absolutely nothing in mind. Then I said, oh, what, what can databases do uh, at all? So then I looked, I said that, well, if there is anything worthwhile in biology, it has exactly happened because of the, the databases were there. And, um, you know, uh, this database, this is, a, this is a, a picture of a herbarium and the gentleman uh, called Carl Linne. Uh, and there's a quotation which I have put for you here of uh, Godfrey. And he said that, well, when possibly Europe realized that there was a world beyond their shores, uh, and then they started sending all kinds of voyages to collect all kinds of herbarium, all kinds of plant and animal specimens, and the herbaria and musea uh, grew in Europe. But then they didn't know what to do uh, with this because there was, there was no problem because everybody was naming the way they wanted. Till of course, so that he suggests was the first in, uh, bioinformatic crisis. Uh, then uh, now we have second bioinformatics crisis. Again, this is a result of yesterday's discussion after the dinner we had with uh, Haley uh, talking about it. So uh, we have now large number of these databases tremendous databases and we have absolutely no rules possibly now first by informatics crisis we could we could survive because we had an international code of botanical nomenclature international code of zoological nomenclature and then they had certain rules but but today uh, you know uh, i think there is a need for what we call international uh, code for um, gene database nomenclature possibly because we do not know which uh, particular data sequence belongs to which species and if that species is really that species at all. So that is the second. Okay, so uh, this is a game that deserves the rules. But yeah, but that, that aside. So quickly, uh, similarly, uh, databases that, that Mendel, this is another major discovery that, that uh, took over life sciences, uh, Mendel's uh, laws, possible because of he maintained tremendous database himself. 
So same is true of Charles Darwin or, or DNA, but that uh, will uh, skip. Okay. So the, what was the question I had for myself? As a graduate student, I was involved in, uh, in an in a undergraduate student, actually. I was involved in that time in early 80s. There was the Biosphere Reserve Program. And my professor asked me uh, to make the checklists, my, because that's, that's all what I was qualified to do. I wasn't uh, qualified to do, conduct some serious research. So my job was to simply put what kind of plants were there in Indian flora or in the Himalaya. So I prepared Himalayan checklist. And once I had done that, uh, one, uh, it was an, I think it took me over an year or so. And that time, uh, we didn't have Excel sheets that much not long ago, but some somewhere in mid 80s. So uh, then uh, suddenly he says, uh, he said, all right, this is all right. But can you put chromosome numbers onto these species? Oh, God. So then I didn't know what to do. So so then I got putting getting to databases that time there were no databases like we have them today so we had that then i said that what which is the which is the book where i can get more, most chromosome numbers so federal was one of the books which which had the chromosome numbers so i got hold of that i will come to that a bit later so what was what was i trying to answer now the question was why are some species rare where others are invasive so it's a fundamental question in, in ecology so when I got to answer that question, I had to read a lot of literature. And when I read it, that I found that there were a lot of uh, people who were saying that, oh, you know, which are the older species, they tend to become extinct. And the, and the younger families, you know, the, that means the recent advanced families, they will, tr they will be mostly invasive or they, they would not. They will be common. But, you know, uh, they were extremely, the, the results were equivocal. So um, nothing much came out of it. Then there are a large number of ecological approaches. Somebody, you know, our ecologist friends, they talk about allelopathy. Somebody talked about soil microbe interactions. Some people would talk about enemy release. Others would talk about increased competitive ability. But I somehow wasn't convinced that I was thinking that there were six blind men looking at the elephant kind of that, that kind of a metaphor, if I may. So then, then I said, let, let me look at it very differently. So I thought that I think there is something in the genes. It must be something in the genes that makes a guy a nasty guy or a bad, bad guy and somebody a good guy. So good guy gets endangered, bad guy becomes invasive. So I must again make another admission that this was mostly again intuitive. Because I had it somewhere back in my mind when I was making those chromosome numbers onto that, there were some numbers which were repeating while others you, you know, so there, there was a certain pattern. Okay, so what did they do? So the best thing is to, you know, when you're not sure, so you begin with home. So I said, that, let me look at Indian scenario, Indian endangered and invasive species, and let me see if I can have some kind of a pattern with respect to this. So I looked at this book called Federal, uh, Chromosome Number of Flowering Plants, then there was this older book by Darlington Wiley. And at that point of time, my own uh, my own laboratory, my own professor came out with this uh, a book, uh, for which again I had no idea. I was only hired to proofread this. So we, I was proofreading this book and again found that there was some kind of a pattern emerging. So I said that let me now get down to working on it. So the second one was that, okay, I got so one that I got, had these databases that time, which was in books, and then I had other kind of database that we where can I get those, that, that's the rare plants, which are red data books. So red data books and that, so two sets of data. One is the books which have the data lists of rare, uh, rare species or endangered species or invasive species, and then which have the chromosome numbers. And it took me about five years to have this paper published, thanks to Riververse. And, it, and they told me that, that I was making some blasphemous, you know, kind of a proposition. But ultimately, uh, I think I was aggressive. I finally got this out. And we I had first time suggested that if you happen to be a diploid species, you, will, you are likely to be endangered. And if you, if you are a polyploid species, you are likely to be invasive. So 
So this was then of course, you usually go through these, uh, you know, how robust are your numbers, you do statistical tests, I don't want to bore you with the, all those. So, and also then second question, oh, was it speech is, uh, was it phyla specific or phylogenetic? So was there a phylogenetic confounding factors? So that was also tested and when I passed the test then. But the second question was immediately asked once I, I had done this, second, oh, where is the empirical evidence? So naturally then I got to, uh, again, which, which I was trained to do at, at, at the graduate, grad, graduate level. So I, I, had, uh, I had a position at the National University of Singapore and then I thought that Singapore is one of the, you know, invasive hotspots. It's invasive hotspots, one of the 10 invasive hotspots in the world. So look around, you'll find only invasive species. So I picked up uh, 13, 14 odd species and investigated them myself and I found lo and behold that all of them were polyploid. Not a single one of them was diploid. And most, and also not only they were polyploid but they were allopolyploids. So now I had empirical evidence. So, so far what I had done was that I had talked about the Indian subcontinent. I had talked about a tiny place which you cannot see on the, on the map called Singapore. Then people said, look here. It actually, in biology, when you when you make a big uh, kind of a when you speak a big idea, scales are very important. Scales matter. So I said, all right. So, but now I can't do with those books. I needed I needed now data sets which 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 are actually global in nature. So then I went and look at. So these are the kind of data sets that I went. If I had to become global in my in my views about uh, um, invasiveness and rarity, then I had to look. So these are different data sets. Most of you would have used them. Uh, uh, and, and then I, this is what happened after that. Now, at the next, so at one level, the second level, which is, which is again an afterthought, which came only after yesterday's dinner, so I have justified eating this dinner. So, so, so the genomes, we know the genome size uh, and such generic traits, they vary according to latitude. Therefore, we had to extract this information of distribution of each of these species. And again, this GBIF came to our rescue and we did this. And then I said, now, what had happened? Why I wasn't, you know, admitting to Tim and them that I, where did I use you? Come on, where did I use your data actually? But this is the problem of a professor because between, uh, you know, starting data search, writing your paper and its publication, there is a gap. So I had conveniently forgotten what I did. Okay. So, so um, therefore, thank you, uh, JBF. That's Raj, Mike, and Steve. This is this is work. So, then, what about global level? What what we said for Indian subcontinent? What we said about Singapore? Was it true for the global level? And then we went about searching global data, and you you can imagine. Actually, uh, people say back breaking. It is actually neck breaking. So it literally broke my neck. I had uh, cervical spondylitis after that because there was too much data to handle, 16, 17,000 species, something like that. But we came with a, a robust uh, kind of an analysis suggesting now clearly that if you, if you have, if you are a diploid, you will necessarily become a, well, uh, you know, about 20, you have 87 to 90 percent chances of being a, a uh, a rare species or a threatened species than if you are a polyploid. And, uh, and by that time, ecologists have started taking me seriously. But by the, before that, they would tell me that, oh, he's a geneticist trying to make his way into ecology. And the, what settled the issue for the world was when Nature picked it up, picked, my, picked our paper for a review. And when this paper was reviewed by, uh, by, by Nature, and then ecologists thought, oh, there, there is some substance in it. And let me uh, tell you at the cost of immodesty that this paper of our Journal of Ecology remains as uh, all-time top cited papers, uh, you know, uh, in its 10 top cited papers. Uh, now, a lot of people, but, but then, you know, 
you have to go, you can't stop there. Now, what was the next? The next was that, let's look at the genome size. What's happening at the genome size? Now, we, we have said that diploid equals uh, uh, rarity, polyploidy equals invasion. Then what happens to genome size? And uh, to, our, to our surprise that we found that lower the genome size, higher the chances of being invasive, higher the genome size, the higher the, uh, higher the genome size, higher the chance of being a rare species. This was a bit of contradiction, but uh, so, so what does it, now I'm telling you something simply. So what did it demonstrate that it said, now we can have a kind of a, um, these traits, polyploidy uh, and chromosome number uh, and genome size, they could possibly have potential unifying role uh, you know, uh, on plant physiology. I'm not going to details into plant physiology. How do they control invasiveness or rarity in species? But what it surely, what we argued is that it provides support for the continued cataloging of cytogenetic traits and genome size of the world's flora. And that is exactly what I was telling Rod yesterday, that can we now georeference this entire data? Because then that would open uh, many more avenues for, for research. So, so this is, uh, so then uh, this is how it, uh, how it came about. And we talked about the, that how, uh, you know, what was the contrasting effect of genome size, chromosome number applied level on plant invasiveness. And again, it was the global analysis. And what we found that globally, it, it was absolutely correct. You have less uh, genome size. As you can see, uh, this, this is statistically highly significant. If the mean, mean DNA C value is low, you are going to be, uh, uh, a, uh, inv an invasive species and if it is significantly large then you're going to be a and then all kinds of uh, these uh, sophisticated uh, analyses were done but where does it lead us to what's the application of it what what did we uh, what, what so this is what we are this is currently under publication this has not been published yet so therefore from these data sets global data sets we are now projecting that what, how exactly, what is the pathway of plant invasion? What exactly happens? So plant becomes polyploid. Then there is something, something strange happens. There is some kind of genome downsizing that happens. And there are, there are, there are a number of research studies which say that genome downsizing happens. And then this guy turns invasive after population differentiation. And that doesn't mean that ecology has, doesn't have a role, but ecology only plays a facilitating role. Basically, a bad guy needs an environment to flourish. But bad guy is basically genetically, no, well, in this case, excuse me, not, uh, I, I shouldn't use too much of anthropomorphization. So, yeah, so all other things are actually supplementary to what happens in the, therefore, therefore, we argue that it is in the genes that if you have to become, if you are endangered or if you have to become polyploid. So what does it do? So it enables us to make general predictions on macroecological theory, the data sets possible, and it assists in quick screening of problematic rexa. So you can, you can use you know, these for management as well as control measures, uh, management for endangered species and control measures for that, for, for invasive species. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, North Americans have, who have inherited or got their endowment from Europe, a lot of, lot of it, and most of them are turning invasive. Therefore, they need to be very careful. Canada in particular has to be very, very careful about it. And they need these management control um, kind of uh, tools for them. So uh, uh, is my time? Okay. So um, you, yeah, yeah. So as they also can help you to uh, ascertain invasion history. That means if you have herbarium records, then you can exactly know that when and where did it arrive from and what, what was the progression of it. And finally, it allows us to you know, make uh, more informed policy choices that, that, that how can we possibly you know, uh, control. Uh, uh, it, nothing is complete because this is a, a pan uh, world 
kind of an audience. Therefore, uh, nothing is complete without quoting United Nations and United Nations documents. So I thought that uh, this is a uh, <laughs> uh, this is some kind of a um, evolutionary responsibility of us uh, that uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which clearly says that each contracting party shall, as far as possible and as appropriate, prevent the introduction of control and eradicate those alien species which threaten ecosystem habitats and species and we we would like to believe that that under these three stages which is the prevention eradication and long term control measures the prevention is the is the first thing that you can do using these molecular and 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 cytogenetical tools so if you have if you if you know for sure that some guy has arrived from um, outside is an alien you can quickly screen it for its 2c dna and ploidy and then see whether it has a potential to become nasty uh, or not so so my ecologist friends um, some of them have changed their religion they have come over to my belief but some are still um, diehards uh, so th those uh, for those i have only this thing to say thank you thanks a lot thank you for your attention Thank you, Raj, for an engrossing talk. We have time for one quick question while we change speakers. Scan the room. Oh, hi. Yes. Um, I, I wonder how did you measure uh, invasiveness? Uh, whether a species is invasive or not, this is an extremely difficult thing to define. Could you tell us a little bit more about Excellent question. That was last 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 time we discussed it a bit. Yes, uh, there's a lot of confusion about invasiveness, but what what we go by is what is on record. So we generally looked at if you if you if we can go back to my uh, uh, earlier slide, then you will see that we ah yeah here it is. So we looked at ISSG uh, database, and we essentially took world's 100 most invasive species okay so such databases so similarly there is another database called uh, pacific inland pacific island er something pyre pyre database there's a pyre database which which maintains only invasive species now for me invasive for me invasive species is one which not only is you know is, is only present in dense numbers uh, you know, but it also is ever expanding its geographical range. So that is the kind of uh, that's the kind of definition we broadly agree on invasion. Hmm. No, the, uh, well, there was a trilogy of them. There, there was one uh, invasive species. Then there were endangered species or threatened, which are listed in red data books, and then there were common species which were neither invasive nor, nor, nor endangered. Great, thanks Thank very you. much.